Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we try to do here every single day. It is Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. Guys, another month is almost gone. What in the hay is happening? <laughs> so crazy. But you know the good news is, so normally time flies, and you're like, time is flying. Right now we're like, yeah, time fly. Just let, let, let's get past this. Can we, can we hurry up? Can we get to 2021? So... Maybe we should be looking at it like that. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And we're getting so much good stuff done. That's my little inspo for the day. (laughs) When you're realizing that you're going to turn another year older really soon, and it just happened like two seconds ago, just be like, yeah, but that year (laughs) really needed to end. Mm -hmm. And it's only just begun. Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) Anyhow, but we are fortifying ourselves mentally and physically and emotionally here. That's right. And in every possible way. So, guys, we in the Better Together community are going to be strong in these Mm -hmm. moments ahead, Mm -hmm. stronger than ever, together, and we're going to get through. Our quote of the day, be brave and be fearless and for God's sake, stand up for yourself. And that is from our guest today, Gretchen Carlson. Of course, she is a reporter, host, journalist, author, who um, whose action against former Fox News mogul Roger Ailes is considered one of the most important catalysts for the Me Too movement. So we're going to be chatting with her today. She launches her own news podcast, which is very exciting, so exciting. for her. Um, I feel like, um, you know, we're able to kind of take our lives into our own hands with the podcasting world. Yeah. It's interesting because Kevin had me in this world before anybody was in it. Mm-hmm. Right? So let's Kev's a visionary. Let's think back. So it's been three mm-hmm. years, six years, nine years ago. Kevin was like, you need a podcast. Let's do this. That's and we so started crazy. and we built in my trailer at Extra. I didn't know we that. We built this like beautiful set and we had the most amazing people help us with that. And um, and we did our interview with Vin Diesel and mm-hmm. Zoe Saldana and a bunch of other people. And so that's where Rob the conversation Lowe, set was. That's where conversations wow. with Maria started. Mm-hmm. And then it became increasingly challenging. Mm-hmm. And not because of me. <laughs> um, because <laughs> dot, of dot, dot. jealousies and how do we hold her down more kind of stuff. And so anyway, that <laughs> became really challenging and I couldn't you know, couldn't do it anymore. And then when I got to E, they wanted me to completely focus on E, which is their prerogative. And so I wasn't able to continue it. And so at some point when I was towards the end of my contract, no, at some point with E, I was, I was able to do Sirius XM. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to push a Friday podcast in there. But it was like, you're almost kind of already late to the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Kevin kind of gets really frustrated with me because he's just like, we were ahead, <laughs> you know? So anyhow, but here we but are. we're here now. Yeah. We're here now. You know what? There's an interesting timing to things because mm-hmm. I, I'm i glad that this took form the, way, the time it did because it took form in a moment of transformation and rebirth for me. Yeah. And I came to the content that I was meant to mm-hmm. to disseminate and to, um, you know, enjoy share. and yeah. share myself and heal myself with, too. So it's all good. And people connect with you because of that. They connect with you because it's obvious that you're passionate about it Super. and that you want to help and... Wicked. Right. And then <laughs> wicked. And that you want to help. You're Super this... passionate. <laughs> but it's true. So I think that's why... This podcast is so powerful, and you're right. Timing's everything. Yeah, it really is. So, if you could help us, everybody, that's right. Help us get more eyes and ears over here. Um, when we post on Better Together with Maria, our Instagram account, which is our hub for all of our stuff, share it with your friends, tag your friends, let them know that we're here and that we have really um, incredible, life changing content and fun. Of course, I was even thinking last night when I was in bed. I'm like, we should just do a post tomorrow. Where we just ask everybody to tag somebody that they think would mm. love being a part of this community. I love that. 
Um, because even however many followers we have on Instagram right now, how many do we have? We're like at 36 We're something. We're close to 4,000. And honestly, my goal okay. is 10,000 by December. And I think we can easily do that. I think we can do that. So just with so you your guys know. help. Exactly. With your help. So help us get to 10,000 by tagging your friends and family mm-hmm. Um, and let them know that we exist and that this incredible information exists. I mean, we're blessed every day to have guests that have so much insight and so much knowledge to help us get better. Um, And so help them come to us. You can subscribe, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. That helps you and us, of course, but it helps you because you get the little notifications that lets you know that we're here. Patreon is kind of our super exclusive uh, group where we do our healing workshops. Of course, you get ad-free content and extra content. This is the time if you haven't signed up, I promise you will be so excited to be inside that community. We're sharing so much amazing stuff in there and we're healing on another level because you have access to these these um, incredible people mm-hmm. that are guiding us um, individually together on a Zoom. So it's been really cool. Uh, you can click the link tree in my Instagram, Maria Menunos, or Better Together with Maria to find us on Patreon. Click, click, click. We make it super easy. In the meantime, we did something really fun recently. So there is a little boy named Leo. And Mm -hmm. he is otherwise known as the Shirley Temple King. You may have seen him on Drew Barrymore's show. Uh, I think he was a big hit there. He is someone who is, I mean, he is well beyond his years. How old is he now? Seven? Question mark? Do you know that for sure? No, that was a that was a definite question mark. That Let me look. I'm Kelsey. gonna Google it. I'm yeah. gonna Google it. Um, well, maybe Jeff can while you're doing whatever you're doing. I don't know, but in January he was six, so that's okay. a good guess. So he's either six guess. or seven. Okay, haha. So Shirley Temple King goes around and Shirley judges Temples. and <laughs> and reviews Shirley Temples. It's hilarious. He is so gr- good on camera. Like he's just mm-hmm. such a spark, and so. It was funny. Uh, he he met me at a pizza place called D&G Pizza. <laughs> Just a little shout out to them because they are amazing and it's uh, delicious food. Mm-hmm. And so we have a little clip of us together that I wanted to share with you guys because he's pretty freaking adorable. And I think you'll like it. So cute. Here it comes, guys. <laughs> What's happening? Hold on. Hold on, everybody. So Kelsey's. Sorry, everyone. Kelsey's. Oh, you want to know why? Because I'm multitasking. Excuse oh, me. Oh, really? I multitasking? Know. We know that that doesn't work, guys. <laughs> it doesn't. All right. That on the Here show. we go. Just make it go loud. We have a very special guest, Maria Menounos. Hi, guys. So excited to be here with the Shirley Temple King. <laughs> and there's two cherries, uh, orange. Uh-huh. It looks like lemon, but it's really an orange. Ice. The color is beautiful i love it let's give it a try okay there we go that is good wow that's actually really good i know it tastes like you're sipping into a cherry but i hate cherries and i like this i mean grenadine is made out of pomegranate it's kind of a cherry taste, but also a pomegranate taste. Yeah, I love pomegranates. Yeah. That's really good. I thought it was going to taste a lot more syrupy. I know, but it's actually not. It's a great ratio of the grenadine and the ginger. So that's really good. <laughs> so that's the key, huh? Yeah. So I think this is a good Shirley Temple. I'm going to give it an 8.8. This is pretty great. Wow, an 8.8. I think for me, since I've never had one, I'm going to give it a 10. <laughs> Woohoo! Yes! Yay! Now, everybody, have a great day. And don't forget, always have Shirley Temple in your life. <laughs> always? Yeah. <laughs> uh, his reaction to the laugh is everything. That's great. I'm not trying to make fun of your laughing, Thank but it sounds like a dolphin. <laughs> yeah, David Letterman, when I was on his show. Mm-hmm. He animated dolphins at the end of the show. It was my my laugh underneath. 
And then I've heard some really other crazy things like goats and don't. I'm going to try to make you laugh. I can't. Okay, so this kid's going to be a huge star. Like, no joke, you're just being introduced to the next big star. Mm -hmm. He's hilarious. And guess what? That was my first Shirley Temple ever. And I really liked it. And I didn't think I was going to because I don't like manufactured cherry, like syrups and stuff. I love the fruit cherries, like plain cherries. But... um. But it was good. It was good. Well, and, and it was hilarious. It was funny too, Jeff, because she was like, "Oh, this is delicious," and we're chatting later, and it's like, "Oh yeah, I haven't had soda in how many years?" Yeah, well, Shirley Temple's made with soda, yeah. so yeah. I was like, "Ooh, ginger she's sucking ale. it down." I was like, <laughs> "Yum!" It but was so uh, he was so cute. He showed up with flowers, Ew. and he's like the perfect little gentleman. He's such a cute kid, and he um, kept saying, "I never want this day to end." <laughs> It was so cute. He had reached out to us or his mom had reached out to us and said, we know you're in Connecticut. We'd love to do something fun with you guys. And we were like, all right, let's do it. Yeah, it was awesome. You know what I loved about it, Maria, is and it's actually we were talking about you're going to be a mom soon. Mm -hmm. And you approached him with a level of credibility and seriousness that other adults don't. A lot of times adults kind of talk down to or condescend to kids and kids don't want that. Kids want to be taken seriously. And I want to credit you as an interviewer because even when you're interviewing little kids, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but I watch a lot of long form interviewers and famous people really condescend to children when they interview Mm. them, but you took him at face value and treated him like an equal. So true. Thanks, Jeff. I would have never thought of that. Is that something, so you don't even, it's just natural for you. Yeah. That's good. That's funny. You know, I've always been like so surprised that kids like love me the way they do. Like guys, kids, love mm-hmm. me like mm-hmm. and they remember me yep. they might be one when they meet me or like two and th- I hear the most remarkable things from like the parents where they're like y- they saw a picture of you and they're like that's my friend mm-hmm. and I'm like what they remembered me it's unbelievable I don't know I think I'm kind of aloof where a lot of people try so hard with yep. kids to get their like you know attention and stuff I'm kind of just like Kid, if you're going to like me, you're going to like me. If you're not, you're totally. going to not. I guess I wish totally. I was like that with adults. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and I was also going to say, I feel like kids are like dogs in the sense that they, they know if you it's like true. them or if they if you don't, right? No, they just dogs know. Dogs can sense it. They sense people they know. for sure. Kids yeah. are smart. They're smart. Yeah, so. it's funny. My friend, <laughs> this is probably bad. My friend, I met her recently with her son who, um, it, let's just say he's a challenging one. He was a little challenging. A little challenging. And he's he's in his carriage. He's like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to well, be he here. He kept saying, help. 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 Get me help. out of here. Get me, oh, get me out of here. Get me out of here. And he was being like crazy. And so I said, kid, I don't want to be here either. So like I turn him around. I go, you can talk to yourself in the window. <laughs> and I turn the carriage around. I go, complain to yourself in the window. Don't talk to me. Because his mom had gone into the market to get him a juice to like calm him down. It was pretty funny. <laughs> she that's was amazing. She we was laughing. <laughs> cry laughing. But I think that's the problem is, you know, and I, I am sure I, I would probably get in the same cycle when you've got a brat screaming at you nonstop. You're going to be like, what can I do to stop you, right? Mm -hmm. And so she just kept trying to figure out, like, what can I give you to make you stop? But that's a a bad cycle, right? But I get it. Like, I'm not judging because I I don't know what nightmares I'm going to face and how I'm going to handle them. And I'm sure that I'm going to handle them all horribly wrong. But when you're not as attached, it's easier to be like, yeah, kid, you want to complain? Talk to the window right there. My mom would ignore me. If I, yeah, she would, she was like, that's cute. That's nice. Keep doing that. That's really not going to help you at all. (laughs) Truly. (laughs) But like we were, I wasn't like that with my parents. So I think this is where Kevin always says we're going to have a challenging time because I was really good. Yeah. And so if I have a nightmare, I'm going to look at them and be like, I didn't do that. Why are you doing that? (laughs) No. I didn't give my parents a hard time. Why are you giving me a hard time? I think they'll learn fast, though. I really do. I think that you and Kev are going to set the ground rules. I mean, when they're babies, they're babies, right? Yeah. But y- you're not going to let your kids act like that. There's no way, and they won't, because yeah. you're going to set the ground rules. Like, I knew. 
yeah, I wasn't getting it my way at all if I acted like that. It wasn't going to happen. So, yeah. You, you guys know, are going to be the same. Like, life prepares you for all this, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even just, like, all of the epiphanies I'm having as of late where I'm really having to set my boundaries on what I'll accept and what I won't accept, which, by the way, is a, a long process. I've been doing this for years. It's just you can't do it all at once. You're just – it's just – Like there are going to be people who suck you back in and then push the buttons and test and manipulate and get back in. So it's going to be a constant process. So don't feel guilty or bad if you haven't quite gotten it. Um, I get sucked back in sometimes too. But I think what's interesting is the timing of everything and the way it's all going, I can see that it's all being laid out Mm -hmm. so that when kids arrive um there's a foundation in place that is proper and what i want for this next chapter of life closing the loop timing's everything right yeah all back to timing i mean this is the right like this was meant to be you guys this is happening Mm -hmm. when it was supposed to happen totally like kevin um john edward had said to me he's like this nine-year cycle that I've been oh it's not been a fun nine-year cycle (laughs) um there have been fun moments along the way of course but uh he's like it's all about cleaning out cleaning out cleaning out and I'm just starting to really look at again and you do it and then you have to look around again and be like oh yeah mm, didn't clean out enough (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. gotta get the mop and glow out let's <laughs> the Lysol might not have been enough oh oh we might need to get the zip guys I'm going vintage now zip, zip. that's I'm what we used to zip. use to clean the nightclub floors <laughs> oh I'm like uh, we need the big buffer machine now oh oh we gotta get the real commercial shit out to get this all cleaned up but anyway you're just cl- <laughs> she did she keeps on for like five minutes and Jeff and I are like uh-huh the best was um the basement flooded oh yeah Someone left the door open in the middle of the um, rainstorm the other day while I was gone. And door was left open and the basement flooded again. And so um, Kelsey was kind enough to run to Home Depot. She got a mop, like one of those big, like ropey mops, because mm-hmm. a Swiffer is not going to help us in this situation. Mm-hmm. And we have the buckets with the handle where you like squeeze it out. And so she put the thing in. And I go, I have a secret. And she goes, what? I go, you got to twist the mop so you can really squeeze everything out. And that's what a real janitor that's knows. Right. Cause I <laughs> that's right. Because I That's right. am a real janitor. Because initially, Jeff, initially she was impressed with me and my mopping skills. She was like, oh, you've done this. Okay, great. And then she went up to me and said, uh-uh, you got to twist Always it. Always got to take it up a notch. Because mm-hmm. no you better You're contracting but not twisting. Is that right? No, so if you put the mop in the the squeegee thing and you you pull the handle down, that's fine. But then you gotta oh. twist the mop so that the ropes go into like a this right. kind of thing, <laughs> uh-huh. and then you squeeze it. Gets all the juices that. out. And it really mm-hmm. gets all the juices out. Mm-hmm. When you know better, you get better. Exactly. 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 Why do we get on the janitorial street, guys? Because you're cleaning up people in your life. Who you... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and my basement. <laughs> yeah, that's right. anyhow um let's get to our guest today i'm so excited to have gretchen carlson on she is an american journalist tv personality female empowerment advocate the co-founder of lift our voices and for three decades gretchen has been a household name in reporting and news she's well known for taking action against fox news ceo roger ailes and her actions are considered a major catalyst in launching the me too movement and advances in workplace harassment, retaliation. She's an award-winning author, speaker, host, and so much more. Gretchen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. You're on the other side of our our beautiful state of Connecticut. Yes, Um, I I, I love it here. Um, During the winter, it reminds me a lot of where I grew up in Minnesota, (laughs) which means there's lots of snow usually, but so far the fall has been gorgeous so it really not has complete. has fall started earlier this year than normal years no i actually think it's been warmer which has been kind of nice because my kids are trying to stay in school you know and they have all the windows open mm-hmm. and so um, they've already warned them that they have to get like extra extra parkas for the winter because when it's 
zero, they'll be hopefully in school with the windows open. Um, So it's been nice for them to not have it be too cold yet. I know we were thinking about if like family does get together for Thanksgiving with windows open, I was going to have like heated blankets for the elderly (laughs) in the room. Ah. So your kids might need some like heated blankets in school. I know. I don't know if they'd allow that. I mean, it's going to be weird. They're going to have like, you know, big down jacket on and then a mask and then a hat Just and to then go to school. gloves. And they'll be like, you know, it's it's almost impossible to, we went to this thing at school outside last week. You can't tell who anyone is, you know? And, and I can't imagine for these kids trying to figure out, you know, especially if they're young, um, some teachers were wearing actually pictures of themselves around their neck so that the kids could know, oh, that's what my teacher actually looks up, looks like when we're not doing COVID. Wow. Um, so anyway, I mean, just to, to see it through the eyes of my kids, and I'm blessed because they're old enough to be able to handle remote school and all that on their own if we go to that. But um, talk about a nightmare for parents and trying to work and trying to deal with your kids and all of that stuff. I know. It's pretty wild. I mean, mm-hmm. and and there's no kind of end in sight (laughs) I was sort of I was sort of thinking like after the first nine weeks I was like oh yeah maybe this will end by the summer now people are pushing it out to next year and I I can't even let my head I can't even let my head go there I just have to stay like focused and tunnel vision and just continue to work on the things that I'm working on and then oh by the way have my daughter apply to college but other than that uh you know just just try to keep focused on the good work that I'm trying to do and the new projects well you know I have to say I wonder when you think about how the industry is all changing the business is all changing do you look now and think I'm kind of glad I don't have to go in and do that right now under these circumstances. <laughs> or do you think this is such an incredible news time? I wish I was a part of it, which I know you're launching your news podcast now. So you're going to you're going to be able to. But I wonder where your head is at with all of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm really excited to get back in the news game with this newsy podcast. Get the news with Gretchen and it's launching subscription on quakemedia.com forward slash Gretchen. I'm really excited about it because it's a down the middle, straight news, 10 minute podcast to just give you the news you need to know for the day. And really what precipitated all of this was being out of the news game for a while and having so many of my friends say to me, hey, where can I just actually get the headlines for the day that I can trust? Because we live in this environment now where People don't feel like they can trust anything that they watch. Yeah. And I'm a yeah, journalist and I'm like, who who do I trust? Who do you watch? I know. And so that was what, you know, how this organic idea was born. Like, okay, I'm going to do just like the top 10 headlines of the day, what people need to know. I'm going to look at sources on the right and the left, and then I'm going to hit it straight out of the park. Um, and, and I've been a lifelong independent, so it really follows sort of the way I think. Like I do look at both sides. I think that's the biggest lesson that you can give to people, by the way, in this hyper-partisan time. Watch something you don't agree with. Listen to something you don't agree with. It's hard. But people right now are in this habit of only watching what they want to hear or listening to what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. So this podcast, I truly, the goal, the number one goal is to make it straight down the middle so that People, in fact, the tagline is keeping you informed, not inflamed. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> I mean, that's where we that's where we are now. Everything yeah. is just hating each other and fighting. And so back to your original question is, no, I haven't missed being in the storm of the ridiculousness. Um, but I'm really excited to get back in knowing that this is my goal and, and this is what I'm going to provide to people. Yeah. And it's also given me a chance to to watch all of my colleagues, you know, and listen to my colleagues. I never had the opportunity to do that before. And, you know, so I have great respect for all the good work that they have been doing. Um, and, and you know, I, I try to watch a smattering of everything to yeah. to stay informed. Who do you so think it's is been, doing... It's been a good learning process for me as well. Gretchen, who do you think is doing the best work out there journalism-wise? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, the first people that come to mind are the women who are covering the White House. Because like who? they are, I mean, I know I've done that role before uh, when I worked for CBS News. It's probably one of the toughest roles in, in television. You're just constantly on the road. You're covering the president. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of at beck and call of, of his schedule. 
Um, and, and I feel like, you know, a lot of these women's voices have been heard over the last couple of years where they ask questions and they're basically not treated great. And they keep persevering. They keep mm -hmm. standing up and saying, no, 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 actually I will be heard. And actually I will ask my question again and there will actually be a follow-up. Um, and there's sort of been this pattern of not treating the women in the room with, I say this lightly, but with the same amount of respect as, as, as anyone else. Um, or, or they're treated worse, I should say. And I, I love how they've banded together. And I, I try to tweet out about them as much as often when they, you know, have some sort of a confrontation because, you know, that's hard. That's hard to, to face every single day sort of being stomped upon. Mm -hmm. And I just have amazing respect for them that they keep getting up and going back to work, <laughs> putting on their boots and going out there to sludge through all the mud. Who's so that those are the people that I think about first. Who's blown you away the most? Oh, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, Dana Bash at um, CNN is somebody that I really trust and follow what what she says. Um, you know, Jake Tapper at CNN is a, is a friend of mine. Um, I mean, there's a myriad of people. I just don't want to, you know, handpick and, it's and hard, single yeah. out. But, but, you know, specifically the women I think have done, there's, there's two correspondents at CBS who <laughs> um, have not been treated the best. Um, and so anyway, that those are the, those are the first people that yeah. I think of. I wonder in your career, um, do you, were you pushed more into opinion-based jour journalism? Mm -mm. Okay. No way. Because... Um, I, I mean, I came up the old school way and I'm so glad that I did that, even as frustrating as it was to pick up my bags and move every two years and, you know, go to, to cities all across the country that I thought I'd never live in, that I grew to love. But I'm really glad I did it the old school way. So I, 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 I wasn't even going to be in journalism. Like my life has worked in so many mysterious ways. I was going to be a concert violinist. So like, wait, you were so stop. good what? too. You were brilliant. I mean, I mean, that was your talent. I know in Miss America. So yeah, but before that, you know, it was it was my career as a kid. And yeah. so anyway, um, I was then I was then I went off to Stanford and I was really focusing on my academics and I was going to be a lawyer. So I took my LSATs. And I figured, well, if I do, you know, really horribly, then I won't apply to law school. But if I do well, then I'll kind of be in a quandary because I was starting to get interested in television. So I knew my LSATs were good for five years, so I could go and start this television thing. If it didn't work out, I could quit it and, and go on to law school. So I started my first job in Richmond, Virginia. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And the best <laughs> thing that happened to me was that a female boss came in soon thereafter and she said, you're covering politics now. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, you're going to cover the governor every day. Now, you know, go back in time. This was 1991. And I was, I think, one of the only females covering the governor on a daily basis. And, um, you know, so that was a very interesting and eye-popping experience for me. But I learned so much. It was like sink or swim. And then I was there two years. Then I went to Cincinnati for two years. That's where I really learned how to do live reporting because I was like the lead live reporter for 435, 536, 11 o'clock news. Um, it was very competitive. I learned how to do investigative journalism there. And then I went to Cleveland and that was the first time I sort of did a split job between anchoring the weekends and, and reporting. Then I got promoted to be the main anchor there. I was part of the first two female prime time local newscast in the country, which was really progressive and wonderful, except it didn't work. So then I got fired, which was traumatic because I had just gotten married. And so now, you know, my my whole like identity had been stripped from me, even though I didn't do anything wrong. It's just like getting fired. I didn't even talk about it for years because there was sort of this shame associated with it. Of course. And then I sat out for a year. I couldn't find a job, you know, and I knew like, you know what it is like in TV. Like I knew that for me to get a new job and move on into my career at the level where I was, I was gonna probably 100% not, I would not be living in Cleveland anymore where my husband was. So yeah. I eventually got a job in Dallas with NBC <clears throat> and I moved there and my husband didn't. So then we commuted, um, but that that was a great opportunity to start covering some stories nationally in, in the region. And then CBS News called and so I came to New York um, about 18 months later. And then I was at CBS for five years as a correspondent. And then I did the Saturday early show, which was always my dream to do 
a, a morning show. And so how I ended up at Fox was because they were offering me a morning show five days a week. And can't say no to know, that. This, this was, well, this was, you know, figure out this was years ago. This was 15, 16 years ago. And so people think of what Fox is now, but in my brain, 15, 16 years ago, I was just excited because I was going to a place where I was going to be able to do a morning show five days a week. Yeah. And, you know, so um, <laughs> not knowing how things were going to turn out there for a myriad of reasons. Yeah. Um, but it's a totally different scenario today when you look at Fox than it was when I went there. I'll leave it at that. Well, yeah, I think for a lot of reasons that you have a hand in, obviously. But you know what? I have found that they never really change. Like, I've had my share of situations and you think, okay, I chose to leave and you lost a big talent. Sorry, I'm gonna toot my own horn. I know what I'm good at. And they'll change their ways. They'll learn that this is not how you treat people. This is not how you, and they just don't. Mm. And so it's it's unbelievable to me. Well, I'm trying to change that. I mean, I, I listen, um, after everything I've been through and putting myself out there and as I always say, jumping off the cliff by myself, I am going to, to make sure that we change this because I think the world felt like we had overcome this already. And and, and the main reason is because we, we throw all these stories into secrecy and that's what companies have been able to get away with. They, they throw us into the secret chamber of something called arbitration instead of an open jury process for these cases. And then they make us sign NDAs. So those are the two ways that you never have, you never heard these stories, even though they were happening, they were happening everywhere in every profession, in every county, in every part of the world, they were happening. And until, you know, we had seen, you know, some stories along the way, but until, you know, I guess I decided to jump, we, nobody cared. The media didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I can say that as a member of the media, if I would have pitched a sexual harassment story, people would have been like, yeah, right. Um, so now that all this has happened and the world has become woke to the fact that women are still facing these situations, I'm going to make sure that I fix it because Listen, I've been underestimated my whole life. I don't know if it's because I'm short or I have blonde hair from, I'm from a small town in Minnesota. Um, none of those mean that you're not you know, smart and <laughs> have the ability to turn the world upside down. But for some reason, people think that. And there's no way that I'm gonna allow this to, to keep happening to millions of women in our country. So it's sort of become my mission, you know, aside from staying in, in the craft that I love, um, I, I'm going to make sure that I change this for my kids and for everyone else's. I love it. Thank you. Because it's needed. I feel like I spend so much of my time helping navigate people behind the scenes and helping them yeah. avoid the pitfalls. Um, and, and it's, it's not just one place. Like I'm sure you experienced these things in every place you went to because it's prevalent and all of these people at the top are all you know, interconnected. So the behavior Yeah, but guess when guess when been... I didn't face it? When I had a female boss. Yeah. It's it's all interconnected. And I and also want to say that I had some amazing male bosses too. I don't want to throw them under the bus. Of course. Um, I mean actually I was not I didn't face any sort of harassment at the majority of my jobs. I happened to on at my first job in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and then, you know, not till I got to Fox. But a lot of that was because I had female bosses and they're, you know, so I always say fixing harassment in the workplace is a tangled web. There's not just a silver bullet, you know, fix. And if there was, I would have done it a long time ago, but it's all intertangled. So like even pay inequity is, is tangled up in it. Mm -hmm. And the way that we don't promote women is tangled up in it, in it. If we actually paid women fairly and, and put them in the boardroom and made them more vice presidents um, or president, we wouldn't have sexual harassment. I mean, it's it's something that is eradicated by actually promoting women. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, it's um, I, I I credit the female bosses that I that I had along the way because they pushed me, they believed in me, and um, and consequently, I didn't face any toxic work environment. Yeah, well, I think that's the part that's like 
it's kind of the next layer of me too is the toxic environments because Mm -hmm. what I have found is and there have been amazing female and male bosses in in my life and then there have been the awful ones and the women protect the men Mm -hmm. which is horrifying Mm -hmm. and you're like wait you're watching this you're seeing exactly what's happening you're Mm -hmm. seeing the injustice and you're just you're okay with that and you're actually protecting them that's the most heartbreaking part of this I actually I kind of have a theory about that it certainly doesn't make it right by any stretch but I think because so few women get into those top positions that once they get there they're straddling the fence you know they're like and listen this has happened to women since we started working it is like one decade we're supposed to wear pantsuits to look more like men and mm-hmm. like then the next decade we're supposed to be to, you know embrace our feminine side and wear pink and then you know the next decade we're supposed to uh, you know be nice to everybody and not speak up and then the, so the idea that that um you know that that suddenly women are in this box and they don't know which way to go and then they get to this high position and they try to straddle the fence like should i you know be nice to my male colleagues because they're the ones who are going to help me get promoted more or am I going to help the women underneath me? Well, if there's only one slot for that woman in a high position, I got to hold on to that position. Mm-hmm. So women, I think, find themselves in these major quandaries. Again, it's not any excuse for letting bad behavior go. Um, but there's also, you know, women and men face the bystander effect. Um, they they just don't they don't help because guess what happens to people who help? They also get. Yeah, blacklisted, demoted, and totally. eventually fired. Well, isn't right? that There's what Megyn Kelly fa- faced? Right? She said recently that she was sad that she didn't do more, but she was like, it would have been career suicide. Yes. Well, I'm glad some of us did, because yeah. somebody had to jump, right? Yeah. And I'm I'm so grateful that um, other women came out afterwards. I would have like I had no way of knowing that that was going to happen because that's the other thing that they make sure that you feel like inside the workplace when this is happening, that you're all alone. Mm-hmm. They make you feel that way. And you're the crazy one. Mechanisms. Right. You're the freaky one. You. It could only be me that he's doing this to. It could, so the idea, I had no way of knowing that other women would come forward. And and that that was just, and I, I had heard through the grapevine that they, <laughs> that, that they only told like 20% of what they knew. And yet that was enough. Overwhelming, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there was there were so many women who felt who didn't go and tell what they knew because they were just scared to death. And and I can imp- I, I I just understand that. Um, but anyway, it 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 is um, it's something that is surreal to me on a daily basis that this actually happened in my life and that uh, it worked out the way that it did in the most positive way possible. I think. Yeah. Because there was no way of knowing what was going to happen when when I did what I did. Well, no, I mean, it was really a jump. And that's the thing that, I mean, it, it's so scary for people to to be honest and to go forward with the fight. Because I know what they'll tell you, the lawyers will tell you it's not worth it. Just take the settlement, go away, just go do your own thing. It's not worth a fight. You're going to suffer in courts. They have more powerful lawyers. You're not going to win. It's going to be a nightmare. And so they dissuade you from doing what you know is the right thing to do. So what was it in your heart that like really said, I'm willing to suffer for the cause? Because you suffered. Well, y- well, first and foremost, it was because I killed myself for 25 years to get to the top of my profession. And when I found out that that career was going to be taken away from me and it wasn't my choice, like in getting fired, uh, I decided if I don't speak up, who will? Yeah. Who will finally speak up, right? So that was that was the first thing. But also, it's not as it's 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 like here we go into how complicated this is. So I had an arbitration clause, which meant that had my lawyers not figured out a creative way to make my story public, you and I would not be having this conversation right now. Arguably, we wouldn't be in this movement right now because I would have been forced into the secret chamber of arbitration, which is where they go and put you so that you don't get a chance to go in front of a jury. And then what happens is 
nobody ever knows what happened to you. You're just suddenly gone from the company and you never get to work again because you can't tell your future employer why you left the old company. Mm -hmm. You're sworn to secrecy. So now maybe you've been at the company for 15 years. The new employer is like, well, wow, we'd really like to hire Gretchen. But then they're like, well, where are your references? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't tell you why I left that company. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't tell you, oh, she must have done something really bad, yep. right? So this is this is how the system works. And then and they blackball you, actually, you behind the scenes yes. and tell everybody not to hire you and that you're a nightmare and you're a diva. Yep. yep, the whole the whole thing. And that's, you know, it's easy to do because that's how women have been pigeonholed anyway. Mm -hmm. and so everyone just believes it. But but speaking on the settlement side, like what I'm trying to do with my nonprofit, Lift Our Voices, is change the way that they actually settle these cases. In other words, we just fall back into these old school ways like you know hypothetically the woman has the courage to come forward she finally complains okay oh we got to get rid of her she's troublemaker right yeah so let's put her into silence and protect the predator no matter who they are and um okay now we'll get rid of her and we'll allow everything to just stay going as it was we'll pay her off we'll make her sign an nda we'll never hear from her ever again okay back to business yeah but here's the solution the solution is the woman comes forward, she has the courage to do so. You do an independent investigation. If you find out that what she's saying is the truth, you fire the predator and guess what? You get to keep the woman working. Why does she have to go? She hasn't done anything wrong. Now there's no need for a settlement. There's no need for an NDA. If of the thousands of women I've spoken to, all they want first and foremost is to keep working. And number two, get an apology. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? They're not asking for a payout because by the way, in most cases, that doesn't begin to pay them what they're worth for the rest of their career because they don't work ever again. Yep. So if, you, if, you would, if we could just get our heads wrapped around this easy cultural change of the way we handle these cases, there would be no need for these silencing mechanisms. So. You know, it's really educating our young people. And I, I, I'm so blessed to have a son and a daughter. But really, as I look through the eyes of my son, it's like, gosh, I've got to teach him how to respect women so that when he gets into the workplace, that he understands what I'm talking about, what I just said. And he's like, yeah, let's actually celebrate women who come forward. They didn't do anything wrong, right? Yep. It, you need people like that to change, to change the system. But don't you think the problem, Gretchen, is that talent has not been um, appreciated enough. I feel like female talent, because ironically, I believe female talent is what keeps the audiences in these news programs. I think that the females have always been, if you look at like Entertainment Tonight, it was Mary Hart. If you look at, and no disrespect to the guys, whatever, but it's, it's just a different thing, right? And so yeah. I feel like the men have always gotten passes, the women are replaceable. Oh, we'll just get another pretty girl. It's not mm -hmm. a big deal. So they don't care. Well, I mean, TV is one of those interesting businesses where you're exactly right. In fact, all the, the studies in local news throughout my career would, would almost always show that the woman was more popular. You know, the Q rating, yeah. which is the rating of how, how popular somebody is on TV. And it was always, and so consequently, I mean, even back a lot of years ago, women in many cases were being paid the same or more than men in local news at least yep. because they were the draw you know so it actually was a good kind of a good business to be in yeah. <laughs> um as far as being paid eventually and i mean let's be honest when you start in tv because so many people want to do it you get paid nothing zippo because so many people would work for free um but if you if you persevere and you keep going you know women can be paid relatively fairly in this business and it's exactly for what you just said they, mm -hmm. they tend to be more popular yeah i mean i was brought into so many different organizations to bring up ratings and i did mm -hmm. but then there was a lot of animosity and jealousy that comes along with that too right and oh, yeah. so listen we have to work triply hard we women yep. have to work so much harder to just survive you know, get, get the same <laughs> respect yeah i mean I always, I always had this sort of feeling in my head every time I moved jobs. Like I knew, I knew what the newsroom was going to be talking about before I got there, and you know, it all, it all hung on that whole Miss America thing. It was like, oh, they hired a bimbo, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, gosh, do I have to go through this again? Like, oh so, yeah. But all it did was, 
it just it just inflamed me to work harder, be the best reporter in the shop and prove everyone wrong. And so I just over time, I realized like I'd start the job and I'd be like, oh, yeah, this is what they think. Yep. And then, you know, I'd work as hard as I possibly could. And by the time I left all of those jobs, I think that I earned the respect of of everyone. But it just shows that women just have to work so much harder at it. Yeah, I know. I remember one big contract I got and um <laughs> and the person the executive said to me you need to earn your spot and i go wait didn't you just give me like a, a <laughs> massive contract and a massive position well, and and did you see where i've come from and all of the things that i've accomplished that no one on your squad could ever accomplish why, why do i have to earn my spot i'm so confused but you basically brought me here it wasn't you that brought me here. The higher ups will bring you in because they know what you're going to do. And then the people below that actually are in charge of you torture you. I had them say to me, we did everything we could to get her to quit. And we're going to do everything we can until we get rid of her. And that was a direct quote from someone's um, manager who wanted me out. So what they did was they tortured me for three years panic attacks I mean the whole shebang and what they don't realize is people are like well, why didn't you quit I'm like I have a family to feed and this is my dream why am I going to quit so I had to exactly. just take it and take it and take it until I could leave and mm -hmm. it's no I mean so and, that's, and that's unfortunately what women have, are forced to do and that that doesn't that doesn't solve the problem like people people will say on social media uh, you know well why why didn't you just leave if it was so bad no yeah. that's not the point yeah you killed you killed yourself to get to, to your position. I killed myself to get to my position. Yeah. Why should we be the ones that should leave because the workplace is toxic? Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, and PS when they bring you in and you actually do the job of bringing up the ratings and the person who didn't bring the ratings is causing all the trouble. And you're like, "Wait, what is happening here?" It's exactly. Bananas. It's, you no. Know, listen, this is this is why I I wake up every morning and and I I have a bracelet on that says be fierce which happened to be the the title of my last book and I some mornings honestly I wake up and I'm like I don't feel very fierce today and then I'm like I look down and I'm like well I got a job to do yeah. got to be fierce yeah. got to bring it out because there's so much work to do to try and fix all of these things yeah. and um and listen there's so many I don't it's not a male bashing thing either there are so many men out there who want to help us mm -hmm. there really there really are and I've yep. met a lot of them and in my book, I actually dedicated a chapter to all the good men out there, never thinking I was going to do a chapter on men. But they came out of the woodwork and they they were like, hey, wait, me over here. I've been trying to empower women my whole career. And, you know, so I wanted to to feature them. It's really, really important that we get men on our team, because as long as they continue to run the majority of Fortune 500 companies and run most newsrooms and yeah. most networks and everywhere else in between, we, we have to educate them on what we're facing and how they can help us. Totally. So uh, we have to do that in a non, non-threatening way so that they don't feel like, you know, like they can't go out to a business dinner with us anymore. It's yes. I wonder with like all of the, the executives who are being ousted for bad behavior, the people who are rising up are, do you feel like we're going to see changes or do you feel like because they were trained by the others that they're just going to perpetuate the same cycles and hopefully and hope that they won't get caught who knows uh i mean i think if i think the real um leadership is crucial and and the mindset because i always say the buck stops at the top mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a predator at the top forget it because because that person is pretty much hiring people just like him Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of person he wants to hang out with because he wants to see it, make sure he can get away with his behavior yeah. and they want to make sure they can get away with theirs. Right. But there are other ways to, aside from having a good leader with an open mind, you know, there, there has to be, there has to be introspection being done by companies right now. Some who think, oh, this is just a passing fad. And if we just survive for a little bit longer, we won't have to make any changes. No. Why don't you use this time to be introspective and figure out how can I make this a more healthy, safer workplace for all? And, and that's the work that I'm trying to do to educate them about the ways that they've been silencing women with NDAs and arbitration clauses. It's interesting, Maria, because I'll go talk to you know big financial groups or other companies 
And the CEOs of these companies don't even realize that they have these clauses in their legal documents because the lawyers for the company have just been so used to putting this stuff together to make sure the company stays safe, but to the detriment of women. And so when I explain to them how they have been silencing women and maligning them and putting them out to pasture to never work again, they're like, wait a minute, do we, do we have those clauses? And then they find out they do and they're like horrified because they really have never been educated on what their own lawyers are putting yeah. into their employment contracts. And by the way, the number one thing that companies want to do right now is retain women in the workforce. And all the studies show that in doing so, you increase your bottom line. So why would you want to put thousands of women out of their professions? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So my education to all of these companies is, you know, get on board, be on the right side of history, join our fight, be, be the maverick out there that's saying, yes, I'm, I'm going to lead the way to make workplaces safer. And, and I will point out, there are some companies doing that. Microsoft was one of the first that took arbitration clauses out of their employment contracts. Wow. Google, the whole Google walkout was about that. It was about payout to predators and arbitration clauses. Guess what Google took out the next day after the walkout? Arbitration clauses. Oh, wow. It shows that you know people have power. Individuals have power. And, and collectively, you have massive power. But you know, a lot of companies join suit then, Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and eBay and Facebook eventually. So, you know, my hope is that there'll be like this massive domino effect and companies will determine that this movement's not gonna go away and that they should get on the right side of history. Have any entertainment companies done it yet? Um, Vice did and um, actually Vox, I believe it was Vox. Um, Condé Nast took out NDAs. Um, like in general, they took out NDAs altogether? Yeah, yeah. They had Whoa. a lot of pressure from, from underneath. Well, well, NDAs for, let, let me be clear. For sexual what harassment. What I'm advocating for with, with Lift Our Voices, what I'm advocating for is NDAs for toxic workplace issues. Yeah. So in other words, not for secret information like the Big Mac recipe. Of course, yeah. Like the nuclear codes, like no, like that, of course you shouldn't be able to go blather about that when you leave the company. But but companies have taken advantage of these NDAs by not allowing to also talk about the horrible things that happen Mm -hmm. to you. And so in other words, they've been able to cover their dirty laundry. Yeah. Because you can never go out and say anything bad about them. And I mean, I'm sure they think that's a great idea, but it's, it's not a great idea for millions of workers. So as far as um, entertainment, I mean, I'll just point you to last fall. This is actually what started me on my nonprofit was that NBC announced that they were purportedly letting women and men who had signed NDAs there for toxic workplace issues get out of them. And so a group of us got together who worked at Fox and had all filed lawsuits against Fox and three of us, three women. And we said, well, if NBC is doing that, we're going to demand that Fox let us out of, of our mm-hmm. agreements as well, our NDAs. So we approached them. Of course, we've never heard back from them, but we got a lot of press attention on that. And that organically moved into, you know, we should really create a nonprofit um, to help the thousands or maybe millions of women out there who are also in this situation, but they don't have the platform or the voice that we have. Mm-hmm. And so that's really how we organically created lift our voices in last December was I was already doing a ton of advocacy work on the Hill for arbitration. And then we created lift our voices and it was sort of the umbrella over adding NDAs to that. The two ways that we keep women down. It's amazing. I have to ask, you know, you watch bombshell Mm -hmm. and you see this movie. And I wonder if you weren't bound by your NDA, um, if you were unmuzzled, what would that look like? Like, would it be another bombshell? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, just think about it for a minute. <clears throat> I worked there 11 years. It's a long time. And I, it, the NDAs are so I stringent, Maria, that I, know. I can't even tell you if the depiction of me in Bombshell or the miniseries on Showtime, The Loudest Voice, was accurate. 
My, my husband can't tell you if it is. My kids can't tell you. My parents can't tell you if it is. That's how far reaching the tentacles of keeping women silent we have tried to do in our society. But this is, this is not just about Gretchen Carlson's story. I mean, look, it would be fantastic if I could one day say everything that happened. But this is really about unmuzzling women who don't have the ability to get the attention that I do. Yeah. This is about the fast food worker who literally cannot afford to come forward. And, and they say, hey, sign this NDA for the horrible thing that happened to you here and we'll, we'll pay you for two weeks. Okay. I mean, when you're deciding whether or not you're going to have food on the table or you're going to sign an NDA, yeah, you, you sign the NDA to get money, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the system that I'm trying to change for all of these people who don't, have never had a voice. And so, yes, it would be great for me to be able to do bombshell too, <laughs> but um, it's bigger than that. You know, it's, it ha it, it's bigger. The mission is bigger than that. It's about helping so many other people. Yeah. That really saddens me to know that there's that much more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it, what kind of, did you do any kind of spiritual work after all of this? Did you do any, uh, what kind of healing did you do? It's a great question because um, the idea of being silenced, nobody's actually really done a lot of studying about women who've been silenced and what the psychological impact might be. I have not really allowed my brain to go there because I'm so vocal with trying to change the system. I mean, that's the one thing that I got out of my agreement was the ability to talk about this issue, which was huge. I also, and I've, I've gone full steam ahead with that. I also got a public apology, which never happened. So my agreement was very progressive four years ago. It was the NDA part that I had no idea we would be at this moment in time where people were actually talking about eradicating NDAs as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, had I known that back then, I would have fought really hard to to not have that as well. If you um, but broke here we your, are in, in this place and time making making change and making progress. If you as broke it as, um, before you go into the, pro if if you yeah. broke your NDA, what would happen specifically? I Just don't want to find out. Yeah. I mean. I mean, they can sue you obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, well, let's just say that if I kicked off the process there, um, I think they'd pay attention to me breaking the NDA. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is you know, this is how this is how they have been able to get away. Not just Fox, everyone um, been able to get away with bad behavior by mm -hmm. knowing, knowing that the the NDAs are complicated. They're they're with more than one party. They're so even if one party said you could get out, you'd still be hung up with other parties. Um, they make them incredibly difficult to to um, you know, to be able to get relief from. As far as the, the spirituality, uh, you know, I I ha have been blessed to have my parents in my life who have been my support system and raised me to be religious. And so I, um, I mean, I would say that my religion is my rock and my foundation in my life. And if I hadn't had that through this really, really, really difficult and painful time, there were a lot of dark days. And um, so I feel fortunate to have been afforded that from my parents and the way in which they raised me. Um, I hope I'm giving that gift to, to my children. I did um, find out about a week before I filed a lawsuit, I found out from my lawyers that I could actually go talk to my minister and tell her what I was about to do, which was like, whoa, I can go tell somebody. <laughs> and <laughs> they said, yes, because it's like, you know, ministers are considered to be like privileged information. And so I went to see her. It was incredibly difficult to muster even up the courage to tell her in a quiet room. And, you know, it was incredibly emotional and we cried a lot. And my grandfather was a minister. And so she knew that. And she said to me at the end, she said, you know, you're about to do something huge and your grandfather is so proud of you mm. and he's oh. looking down on you right now i know i know he's so proud of you and you're doing the right thing and um i have to say that that was probably the final thing that pushed me Whew. that was probably the final thing that 
made me know that I would be okay no matter what, you know, what happened. So yes, I'm very spiritual and, um, and I always know that I'm not alone. And I think especially in a situation like this, that was just crucial. Yeah. Wow. I just like felt everything you probably felt in that moment of like, you're ready to jump off that cliff and how scary all of it is because the thing that people don't realize is these people in power are so good at what they do. They're such good manipulators and they are so good at selling their version of the story to everybody and demeaning you in the process and the lies they could concoct about you that are so believable. Like they can make anything believable. And you as somebody who's been in the system know, oh yeah, this is probably what they're going to do. Oh, they could easily say this lie and create this lie and create that lie. And now you're not even dealing in a fair fight. Right. And, 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 and especially when you are then silenced and you can't, you can't actually set the record straight. I mean, they, and they did do that. Listen, the first thing out of their mouths was that I was fired because I had bad ratings and, you know, yep. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's just the common, oh, yeah. the common thing to, to, to go to. I was um, Maria Mean Nunos. I mean, the press they put out about you too is like amazing. The mm -hmm. press assaults yeah. of you and, know. and that you know that's the one thing that my lawyers told me before I, I filed they said the one thing we know for sure is that they will try to kill you yeah they they will try to malign you to the to the nth degree and you know and they did but I was ready for that and and I also think Maria that because of being in TV, you probably feel the same way. I mean, it never feels good, but because we've been in these roles for so long, we're used to people criticizing us, like, you know, a bunch of viewers saying crazy stuff to us and, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, you're fat, you're ugly, you, I hate that outfit. You know, for women, it's always about how you look. And your hair. And so, I, I had, yeah, your hair, like, I developed such a thick skin already from being in the business. Not, not saying that all that maligning didn't still hurt a lot, because it did. But I think I was, I knew what they meant when they said, people are going to attack you. And actually, that's like some of my greatest advice. I've gotten really good at it and it's, it's hard, but to, to not even look at that and just be in control of what you can control, which is how you respond, not, not what they say to you. You're always going to have critics. It's about how you respond to it. That's what gives you your power. And so, you know, oftentimes when people would, would criticize me or say, you know, why don't you just go away and go back into your basement and, you know, and, or, or you're so ugly and how could anyone ever sexually harass you? You're so ugly. And so sometimes I would, when I was like in a really funny, good mood, I would write back and be like, oh, I'm sure you're a perfect 10. <laughs> and, and then they would, and then they would write back and they'd be like, oh, well, or, or I would say like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry you woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. I hope you have a fantastic day. Like I would just <laughs> kill them with kindness. Yeah. And then they would get, they'd be like, oh gosh, she responded to me, you know, and, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't really mean it in that way. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, maybe I changed, you know, a really horrible person into a better person today but I took charge and and took power of how I was going to respond and not let them be dictating how I was going to feel about myself and that's just such an important message I think today with so social media in general but just the way people feel so comfortable you know criticizing other women or other people I was going to say especially women it's great advice um, yeah to take to take control of how you respond and to not get mired in reading all of that stuff yeah, it's you not, gotta know who you are right. so they don't tell you who you are. Right. Um, what was your biggest victory in all of this, you think? Oh my gosh, um, seeing my courage transfer to my children. That was the, uh, the biggest unexpected and the most rewarding for all of us. It was, they were my greatest, greatest concern, obviously. They were young teenagers at the time when I did this. I had no idea how they were going to be made fun of or speaking of social media, um, attacked. And um, so they were my paramount concern. But I saw my courage transfer to them and in a really kind of short period of time. And just two quick stories about my daughter 
she had been having some trouble with some girls at school and she had never found the ability to actually you know stand up for herself and so a couple weeks after my story was resolved she came home and she was bounding you know into the kitchen she was like mom she's like i i finally spoke up for myself today she goes those those girls who've been bullying me she said i told this one that and i told the other one this and she goes mom she goes i did it because i saw you do it and i was like oh my gosh maybe this is going to be okay you know wow. maybe it's going to be okay for me but also for her and then my son who was probably 12 at the time i had been doing a town hall on cnn about sexual harassment and i then traveled after that and i came back home she, he was waiting for me in the kitchen and he had this look of consternation on his face and he said mom he said is it true what that other woman said on tv with you that once every 73 seconds in our country that a woman is harassed or assaulted. And I said, I'm so sorry to tell you that that is true. And he looked at me and he said, as a young man, mom, I want to help fix that. Come yeah. On. I, <laughs> Kelsey's hysterically I, crying. She just gets streams I of tears. I hugged him so hard. I mean, I, I hugged him so hard. Wow. And then he went downstairs to play PlayStation. But I, <laughs> I, I went into my husband's office and I'm like, this is what our son just said to me. Like, if we can multiply this, that's, that was the day I realized how imperative it is to get to our young boys, to get them to understand our fight. And he got it. And, and that's, you know, a couple of years have passed now since those stories and I continue to see it. Like he'll, he'll look at me, he'll hear something on TV and he'll look at me and be like, mom, that's so wrong. Like he gets it now. And, and, and so does my daughter. So even if I just changed those two lives, it would have been worth doing what I did. Yeah. But I know it's so much greater. And, and I see it multiplying across the nation and the world. And, and that's what keeps me going. But it was it was the most unexpected, the most surprising, and the most rewarding all wrapped up into one thing. Wow. I mean, that is just beautiful. Wow. I mean, I was expecting you to say so many other things. I would have never thought that you would have those stories. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it keeps it keeps building. You know, they I hope that they've passed that gift of courage to other people because I like to say courage is contagious. Totally. Well, yeah, it's an example. People get to see another way, right? Um, and you started a movement, a really important movement that is is giving people a voice and and giving people courage. I think it's incredible. So, um, yeah. You know, Gretchen, I have one quick question for you. Given the stats that I'm just horrified by, I'm positive there are listeners in their car right now hiking right now who are facing exactly what you've described during this show. What advice do you have for them? And first of all, even just moral advice, right? Like how can you encourage these women and what practical advice do you have for them in their workplaces to, to tell their truth? Yeah. Thanks so much for the question. So actually chapter four in my book is my playbook for everyone. I always say you should just rip out that chapter and put it in your back pocket because it's my <laughs> it's my top 12 points of, of what you do if you're facing this at work. And so I'll just highlight the, the top three in my mind. Um, the first thing is that you have to call a lawyer. I mean, you, you have to call a lawyer. You don't go to HR. You have to call a lawyer and just figure out what kind of case you have. You may be out of statute of limitations. You, um, you know, there could be a myriad of things. So you need to get outside legal advice. And there are a lot of places right now, betterbrave.com, um, that will hook you up with lawyers for free. So that would be my first piece of advice. The other thing is evidence, gather evidence. You must have evidence. We still live in a he said, she said world. If you have evidence, you know, that's, that is just so important. Um, and the third thing is to tell somebody tell somebody. I know how hard it is, but again, it, it plays into the idea that if other people know that you said something to them and they're called in and they tell the truth, that bolsters your story. And there's a bunch of other points that are more complicated, but those those are the top three. Um, and, and, and the other thing what I've learned is that, you know, we've made a lot of progress right now over the last four years. The idea that women are even being believed, that's massive. Mm -hmm. It's easier, it is easier to come forward now. We've seen 
we've seen men uh, go down, right? And, and offer apologies right away. So we've seen the media interested in covering the stories. That's my other big piece of advice. Go to the media, go to tell your story because that that is the biggest way that you can take your, your own power back and control your own narrative. Um, but anyway, if people want to know more, they can they can go to my website or they can um, pick up my book um, or they can go to liftourvoices.org as well and learn about all the other work that I'm doing um, if they want to join our fight. Amazing. I um I think that uh, if you guys want more, like she said, Lift Our Voices is on your website, right? Well, it's a separate, it is, but it's a separate website. So GretchenCarlson.com or liftourvoices.org. Got it. Or if they want to hear the news, they can go to quakemedia.com forward slash Gretchen. <laughs> Got it. Will there be a link to your podcast on your website as well? Yes. Okay, great. It's will. usually yeah. easier for people if they just like know they're going to one hub and Gretchen exactly. Carlson is really easy to spell. So go to Gretchen Carlson. Get the News is her new podcast. 10 minutes. I love bite size, simple and easy. Um, Gretchen, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure chatting with you today and and um, thank you for everything you've done. Oh, well, you're, you're welcome. I, I've always admired you and had a chance to interview you several times before. And I think if we uh, got together in person and had oh. coffee or a glass of wine, we'd have a lot of stories to share with each yeah. other. I would love um, to do that sometime, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and in that time when I actually get out of my NDA, <laughs> then we'll have even more stories to share with each other. Oh, for but, sure. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to work on helping everyone else get out of theirs. So, I love it. Thank well, you for if, having me. If you here. ever need my help in any of that, I am right there with you. Thank you. Great chatting with you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Oh, man. All right. Well, yeah, I'm sobbing. <sighs> oh, man. I that... saw Kelsey and like, <laughs> woo, tears I are know. like pouring down. Well, that story about her son. I, know. I mean, like, her grandfather got me too. I was I, like, me too. And she had told us that I had heard that story when Jeff and I spoke with her the other day. And it got me then and it got me now. But yeah, the story about her son just really, it's like, gives me hope and her daughter like i know to be able to stand up for yourself by the way like oh, we're grown-ass women and it's hard for I us know. you know, know. Let, let alone a little kid in school so i think I uh i think she's setting a really great example for her kids and that will have a ripple effect it just mm -hmm. there's no way mm -hmm. when you start to see other people stand up for themselves and yield good results and you're that's like right i can do it too courage is contagious right that's what me too is about yep. one woman comes forward another yep. woman comes forward it's like strength in numbers mm -hmm. you feel like okay don't have to sit quietly anymore with this pain mm -hmm. um anyhow amazing Oof. amazing amazing thank you guys as always for being with us on this journey i hope you enjoyed this episode if you did uh check out episode number 71 that is our recommendation today it's with oprah's life coach martha beck whose decision to pursue the life she actually wanted cured her from illness Join us tomorrow, of course, for a recap of this week's guests and so much more. We're going to talk about how we're implementing our tools. That's right. We've already ordered our soy milk. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> shoot. Um, in the meantime, follow us at Gretchen Carlson, at Jeffrey Crane Graham, at Kelsmeyer2, at Better Together with Mermit. At Better Together with Maria. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.